This is Duke University. The real beating heart of today is our speakers and our students. Um, so I wanted to ask the students to stand up so that we can recognize you, the st my students in 302. You just stand up quickly. Because honestly, their willingness on this bumpy ride um, to come along with me and the speakers as we invited them to join this workshop and then to so with such an open heart and willingness to produce artwork. Obviously, what today's event is about is World AIDS Day, which is tomorrow. And we're 35 years plus into the epidemic. And we can ask ourselves, where are we 35 years into it? And where are we going to be going? And so we have a little bit of all of that. Looking back, where are we now? And looking forward, sort of written into the um, program today. So we've made a lot of scientific progress and some social progress, I think. Uh, lots of people have access to ARVs, but not everyone does. And the folks who don't have access to ARVs are often women and uh, folks in the uh, resource poor developing world. Um, so a lot of what we're looking at today are the looking at the, through the lens of the folks who don't have access to some of the remarkable progress that we've made over these 35 years. But I also had three prisms to look at HIV AIDS, and that is art, activism, and, ac and academics. So first, academics. So when you think about the beginning of the HIV AIDS epidemic 35 years ago, we didn't have this field called global health yet. So it's kind of remarkable to think that global health has emerged in many respects as a part of the HIV AIDS epidemic. So my question is, where, what is the role of global health in relationship to HIV AIDS? Um, and what is the role of training our, our young global health practitioners um, to think about HIV AIDS in the future as we go forward in different ways? And that's a lot about what we're doing today with the art and the archives. So using art and archives to train a new generation of global health practitioners. The archives part is embodied uh, in boxes here, literally, and in um, the a donator and the remarkable woman who created the archives that constitute um, the art event that we're looking at today. So Marie de Brun um, donated her life's work as one of the first medical anthropologists uh, to work in the NGO landscape on HIV AIDS in, uh, in Europe. And when I heard about that, it immediately created in my mind a whole list of possibilities. Archives related to HIV here at Duke. I teach about HIV AIDS. How can I get my students into the library, number one, into the archives, number two? So those were two really big challenges. And the way that I thought about doing it was to do it through art through engaging with these archives in a different way. And that's where Kelly Swain's work comes in to play here. And she has um, developed in the classroom uh, an art technique called the humanment that she'll talk about a lot more. And she has been here over the past two weeks leading a workshop that invites our students to engage with the archives through a creative lens. That's really remarkable. And then, of course, the activism. And that is uh, something that it will uh, help us to think about people who are involved with HIV AIDS activism today and thinking about the future as well. And so we have an activist here who's going to share, uh, Alicia Diggs, share with us her work in the activist sphere right here in North Carolina. So um, it's just an arm's reach down the street. So you can engage with HIV in the archives and also uh, get involved in activism as well. So that, I hope, sort of gives you a little bit of a flavor for the background to this, to this uh, wonderful collaboration and this activity. So let me just turn uh, very briefly and um, introduce our speaker, my, my great collaborator, Rachel Ingold, who has been essential in developing uh, access to the archives for the students and in collaborating and brainstorming this whole event. And I, none of this would have happened without her. And I'm going to turn the microphone over to her in just a minute. But just so that you know that Rachel Ingold, since uh, 2010, has been the curator here um, of the history of medicine collections in the Rubenstein Rare Books and Manuscripts Library. And we've been working together closely 
since the very beginning on this project. Hard to believe, but here we are on the day of the event. So let me turn over to Rachel. Thank you, Carrie. Um, it's been such a wonderful opportunity to work with you and your students who have done incredible things and with Kelly over the past two weeks. Um, it's been a really in interesting and enjoyable experience for me as a curator. Um, it's an experience that would not have been possible without the Maria de Brun collection. And Maria, I wanna thank you for donating your work, your life's work in the field of global health. I know that we are all very eager to hear Maria speak along with activist Alicia and poet and writer Kelly. Um, but I wanna talk really briefly about the role of archives and special collections in documenting the work of people like Maria and Alicia. Many of you are aware that the Rubenstein Rare Book and Manuscript Library has numerous collections. Along with the History of Medicine collections, we have the Sally Bingham Center for Women's History and Culture. We have the John Hope Franklin Research Center for African and African American History and Culture. We have a human rights archive. We have a university archives that documents the history of Duke. And we have numerous other collecting areas and a few other dedicated centers, which all have the mission to acquire, preserve, and make available materials for research. In the Rubenstein Library, we have numerous collections, some that document organizational work of groups here in North Carolina, such as the AIDS Task Force of AWARE, the records of the group outright, a Durham-based group that was working in the 90s on HIV education. Our Human Rights Archive has collections like the Women's Refugee Commission, the International Monitor Institute, the ACLU Records of North Carolina, and I could go on and on, but I won't. I mentioned these collecting areas and these collections for their importance in documenting and making available for research materials of activism and social change. When we discuss archives of social change and archives of social movements, let's be sure to include medicine and science in that discussion. What do the roles of science, medicine, and the humanities play in social activism and how do they all relate? One goal is a huge commitment to make people's lives better. And today we're focusing on a big part of that, recognizing that HIV and AIDS continues to demand medical and scientific research, but also recognizing the people, the activists, the educators, those living their lives and those doing the work as a result, those who document the human aspect and the human aspect of medicine, science, and global health. I'd really like to thank the students in Professor Stewart's class. They were the first group to really delve into this collection and immerse themselves in the work to create some really remarkable projects. I want to encourage everyone to visit the Perkins Library student wall, which has their artwork on display. That will be up through February. We also have a small case in the Josiah Charles Trent History of Medicine room, which is right across the hall. And in one of our display cases, we have materials, a very small sample of the Maria de Brun collection, and I invite you all to go in there. I'd also like to thank my colleagues here at Duke and beyond, my colleagues in libraries in general, and my colleagues in archives, those who work to make items accessible. And I'd like to ask that those who are activists and people working in the field consider donating their materials. We would all like to see the Global Health Archives grow. And I'd like to encourage people to use our collections, all of our collections, and know that these items are here for anyone to use. We work closely with the Duke community and students, but I encourage faculty and staff to also consider our resources. And please know that we work beyond the Duke community and are really open for anyone to use our materials. We welcome use of our collections in all aspects using materials for historical analysis and historical academic papers. But we also encourage other uses of our collections. And we've had people use our collections, collection material for projects such as artist books, for photography exhibits and art installations, for musical performances and more. And as we think about the role of humanities in global health, it will be fitting to hear all of our speakers today. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Maria de Brun. 
Maria de Brun is a medical anthropologist who worked for nonprofit organizations in, in the Netherlands and the United States, as well as international non-governmental and United Nations agencies in the field of sexual and reproductive health and rights, with a special focus on HIV and, health and AIDS and health-related human rights. She served on the Global Program on AIDS, Global Management Committee Task Force on HIV AIDS Coordination as one of three non-governmental organization representatives. This task force contributed to establishing NGO participation and the governance of UN AIDS. She was also a co-founder of the Athena Network to advance gender equity and human rights in the global response to HIV and AIDS and worked with groups of women living with HIV on sexual and reproductive rights and advocacy. Her donated collection includes numerous research reports, training curricula, advocacy resources, brochures, pamphlets, booklets, posters, and other materials from around the world, which were designed to educate and inform varied populations about HIV, STIs, safe motherhood, pregnancy, human rights, sexual orientation, and other aspects of sexual and reproductive health. Please join me in welcoming Maria. I'm going to be reading my presentation because if I speak extemporaneously, we'll be here at, say, 8 o'clock tonight. I don't want to keep you that long. But I have some slides that I hope will show you some of the kinds of materials that are in the collection because there are some really interesting things in there. But I'd also like to start with some thanks. Thanks to Carrie Stewart for inviting me <laughs> to take part in this event and for using materials from the collection. That was really great. I'd also like to thank, thank Rachel for in, uh, accepting the donation in the first place so that these materials have found a home where other people can, can take advantage of them. And I'd like to thank Kelly Swain for introducing an, an artistic element as a means of working with archival materials in the field of health. Art has been used before in the field of HIV and AIDS, as you can see from these examples at international AIDS conferences. Not only painting, photography, and creative use of condoms has been featured, but also the written and spoken word with testimonies and advocacy by people living with HIV, putting a myriad of human faces to this condition of ill health. The HIV epidemic was the first in our modern history to incorporate the presence and perspectives of people affected by the health condition in policy making and programming. This was propelled first by gay men who were affected and their allies. The fact that UNAIDS became the first UN organization to include civil society representatives on its governing body also contributed to this. Ultimately, a broad spectrum of people living with HIV has been involved to a lesser or greater extent including those who are focused on specific groups such as substance users, prisoners and detainees, sex workers, and adolescents. Today I'd like to give you some examples of how the inclusion of women living with HIV has been furthered. The promotion of women's voices has had to contend with many obstacles. A major one has been stigma and discrimination. There is the stigma that was long associated with HIV and AIDS because of their associations with sex outside marriage, drug use, and death. This was evident in the early educational posters and materials which were designed to scare people into abstinence or at least protected sex. That eventually changed to a more balanced approach, especially when antiretroviral drugs help decrease possibilities of transmission. Yet the fears persist as evidenced by the fact that there are laws criminalizing HIV transmission in many countries, including this one. Women have also had to contend with the effects of sexism, for example, being seen as sluts if they became infected after having more than one sexual partner, as powerless victims if they were faithful in marriage yet became infected, as irrelevant if they were lesbians because they supposedly couldn't be infected with HIV, and or as guilty if their children contacted HIV at birth or through breastfeeding. The terminology has been slowly changing, but subtly discriminatory terminology is still being used today. The use of two overarching principles has helped in addressing the combined stigmas of AIDS and sexism. One is the use of a gender-based perspective and the other is the human rights-based approach. When I had an article published in Social Science and Medicine on Women and AIDS in Developing Countries in 92, it was one of the first on this topic in the Social Science Journal. I still had a lot to learn about terminology. 
Today we speak of women living with HIV or AIDS to express that they're not defined by the illness, not victims, not sinners, not criminals, but persons dealing with a difficult health condition. Nevertheless, we still need to address hurtful and stigmatizing terminology that is used to speak about HIV. For example, it can be very difficult for many women to take their da daily antiretroviral therapy consistently due to factors such as distance from health clinics, poverty, continued fears of discrimination, violence in the home, side effects of the drugs. Leading spokesperson internationally, Martha Tolana, remarked last year, I quote, mindfulness in use of language is important. Am I, quote, lost a follow-up or have I been bullied into care, out of care? Alice Wellborn, another internationally well-known woman living with HIV, remarked, some UN documents seek for us to, quote, achieve viral suppression. And if we don't, health staff, even some male activists with HIV, brand us as defaulters, failures, and wasters of resources. Another example, policies continue to talk about mother-to-child transmission, which implies that the woman is responsible for any possible infection. It ignores the fact that her partner likely had HIV too. Advocates have spoken for years about using alternative terms such as vertical or perinatal transmission. Yet UNAIDS revised 2015 guidelines on terminology still promote the use of the phrase mother-to-child transmission. Oddly, in the very early days of the epidemic, vertical transmission was the term that was used. For people to hear the perspectives of women and girls living with HIV, they need to have access to audiences. For example, I supervised Hannah Janssen's MA thesis, the first in the Netherlands on living with HIV. Subsequently, I included her as a co-facilitator in the Royal Tropical Institute's program for doctors going to work in the tropics. Many of them still had fears and stigmatizing attitudes. In Vietnam, I worked with colleagues to include two women living with HIV in a training course for obstetricians so that they could hear directly from a client perspective what the women needed and wanted. As a growing number of women contracted HIV and eventually began speaking out about this, it became evident that those working in the field needed more resources to address the gender-based aspects of the epidemic. In 95, when I was working at the Royal Tropical Institute, we were commissioned by the Global Program on AIDS to produce a resource pack on gender and HIV, and it became a popular tool published in English, French, and Spanish. In 2001, I contributed to another resource pack on integrating a gender perspective into HIV and AIDS programs. And in the years that followed, my presentations and publications regularly focused on gender-based aspects of the epidemic. Of course, increasing numbers of other advocates were doing the same thing, which was a very welcome development. In another project, I worked with Nadine France of the Health and Development Networks and Carmen Murguia of the Instituto de Educación y Salud in Peru to create a new activity-based curriculum for young people, gender or sex, who cares. The exercises, text, and visual design were tested by 21 NGOs in developing countries and 440 participants at international AIDS conferences. The pack was published in 2001 with activities that included storytelling, drawing, acting, debates, and discussions on topics such as stigma, gender stereotypes, and living with the virus. The Gender or Sex Who Cares curriculum became a central resource for a training of trainers workshop that I gave to women living with HIV from Botswana, Kenya, Malawi, Namibia, and Uganda. And just the other day, one of the women sent me a Facebook message saying, I really think fondly of gender or sex, who cares? <laughs> Promoting the voices of women living with HIV involves skills building and training. They use the resource in their own trainings back home and acted as co-facilitators when we presented the workshop during skills building sessions at regional and international AIDS conferences. Jenny Gatsi Mallet and Marie Kudzani Banda, who participated in the TOT, thereafter carried out projects on reproductive health and rights in Malawi and Namibia, incorporating the issue of unsafe abortion, but also other aspects of health. 
In a follow-up project, I supported them in learning how to interview women, write and edit their stories so they could use the materials for testimony and advocacy booklets. They disseminated these to the leaders in their country. They were also supported to attend international conferences and UN sessions to present their work and talk about the needs of women living with HIV whom they represented. Other organizations started supporting their activities as well, and Ms. Gatsy was successful in bringing a course to, uh, case to the Namibian Supreme Court on the human rights violation of coerced sterilization of women living with HIV. The human rights-based approach was adopted early on by women living with HIV. In 92, the international community of women living with HIV and AIDS, known as ICW, was launched at the International AIDS Conference in Amsterdam. I was one of the few HIV-negative women who had contributed to this, offering training during their pre-conference on how to deal with the press and ways to overcome stigmatization. The ICW members issued a 12 statements document that outlined the rights that they were pursuing, and they still are today, 24 years later. In 2002, women living with HIV and their allies issued the Barcelona Bill of Rights at the International AIDS Conference. It was a progressive document stating, for example, that women and girls have the right to a broad array of preventive and therapeutic technologies regardless of age, HIV status, or sexual orientation. A reference to safe abortion made it a somewhat controversial document, with some UN representatives declining to promote it for that reason. However, it still does guide the work of the International Athena Network. In 2004 and 5, I worked with various civil society groups to produce a monitoring tool which women could use to assess how well local policies and programs were fulfilling the reproductive rights of women affected by and living with HIV. In 2009, a curriculum developed for short workshops on reproductive rights using testimonies and stories from actual women as case studies was published in versions for Africa, Asia, and Latin America. UN and other international agencies have issued contrasting documents with regard to support for specific rights affecting women living with HIV particularly regarding safe abortion and adoption of children. The UNAIDS 2006 International Guidelines quite specifically emphasize safe abortion as a matter of human rights. However, six years later, the report and recommendations issued by the Global Commission on HIV and the Law only made recommendations to stop coerced sterilization and abortions, merely mentioning safe abortion in a footnote. The UNAIDS guidelines regarding foster care and adoption of children state that a positive HIV status should not form an exception in and of itself to this parental right, while the Global Commission, six years later, stated it should be legal but failed to make it a recommendation and added a phrase that implies people living with HIV should be considered for adoption of children living with HIV, not any child. The issue of unwanted pregnancies and pregnancy termination has had a wavering history at international conferences as well. The number of accepted abstracts, posters, and presentations during the official program is generally low. A high point came in 2010 with the first plenary session on HIV and abortion. Satellite symposia and present presentations also covered the topic. This year, there were fewer than 10 abstracts on the topic again, although Lucindo Hanlon of the UN's Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights did make a presentation on common threads linking criminal laws related to sexuality, sexual health, and sexual conduct, including consensual sex by adults, HIV transmission, exposure, nondisclosure, and abortion. From 2002 on, it became apparent to me that qualitative research would benefit greatly if women living with HIV were involved in conducting it. I was able to give some of them funding and training and included them as co-authors in resulting reports. This is still not a widespread practice. It was only this year, 2016, that a peer-led global study of care and treatment access for women living with HIV was conducted with funding from UN Women. 
Simply advocating for inclusion in research and training is insufficient to guarantee that the perspectives of women living with HIV, as well as young people, sex workers, and members of other marginalized groups, will inform policy and programs. To be able to participate substantively, rather than as a token person with HIV, they need skills development for community work, lobbying, and interacting with people in positions of power. In a project led by Jenny Gatsi in Namibia, women living with HIV interacted with municipal and health authorities to initiate health ethics committees in local clinics that it benefited everybody in the community. Eventually, the Ministry of Health took over the health ethics clinics. In Malawi, Marie Kudzani had staff of the Malawi Human Rights Commission and National Nurses Council participate in her workshops. Skills building in lobbying and advocacy is a need expressed by women living with HIV repeatedly. As just noticed, noted, some of this work focuses on the local and national level. Yet today, still very few women living with HIV are included in the plenary and mainstream sessions at international and regional AIDS conferences. Alice Wellborn had this to say about the 2016 conference in Durban, quote, I got mad in public. It was in yet another panel about women with no woman actually living openly with this HIV virus on the platform. My outburst from the audience, especially when the panelists talked about women's leadership, the need to link with the women's movement and the idea of addressing huge rates of HIV among young women in sub-Saharan Africa with PrEP, was about the absence of a woman living openly with HIV on the panel the mad lack of funds for women's rights activists to take part at all, and the huge need to hold on to bodily integrity when it comes to treatment. So what remains to be done? Many of the issues which activists, researchers, advocates, policy contributors, and women living with HIV have addressed over the past three decades, unfortunately, remain insufficiently addressed or unresolved. So attention to them must continue. These include concerns such as forced sterilization, access to effective contraception and safe abortion care, the factors that continue to make young women so vulnerable to HIV infections such as violence and poverty, and access to antiretroviral treatment that fits with the contingencies of women's lives. As Alice Wellborn commented, whilst UNAIDS asserts that 17 million people with HIV are now on treatment, there are huge challenges, as our research shows clearly, between starting and staying on medication. This is what can easily lead to HIV drug resistance. Regarding HIV prevention, pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP, is now being promoted as a preventive tool. But the concerns which young women may have, especially in developing countries, may not always be addressed. Alicia could undoubtedly tell you more about how that is going in North Carolina. Some groups of women continue to be insufficiently included in HIV program and, and policies around the world. They include young women and girls, older women, women using drugs, sex workers, and transgender women. It's challenging for people to keep the need to listen to affected women's voices in the forefront of their minds. For example, when I was invited to participate in this panel, I was pleased that my suggestion to include a woman living with HIV among the panelists received a good response. These rem reminders remain necessary for all of us who work on HIV and AIDS or any other health condition for that matter, such as the new problem we're facing with Zika. Women in areas with Zika have received health advice with no gender-based understanding of what it means for them to be held responsible for their own infection by a mosquito, to be told they shouldn't get pregnant when they may be in relationships that preclude regular contraceptive or condom use due to violence, poverty, or other factors, or they may have become infected during the first weeks of pregnancy when they had no idea they were expecting. And now they may live in a place where they can't obtain a pregnancy termination if that is what they want, because they don't have the means to care for a disabled child. So where have been and are the voices of women living with HIV? 
They have been present throughout the epidemic. You can find numerous documents in the archival collection with their stories and testimonies. These women are, are speaking out forcefully today too, but it is up to us to support them in finding and creating venues where their perspectives, desires, and needs can not only be heard, but also taken into account. While much remains to be done to promote their meaningful participation, we should also celebrate the progress that's been made. Here on the right, you see Veronica Colombi, a woman living with HIV in Namibia, and she's pictured with the country's first lady, Monica Heingos. This selfie, taken in the past month, would have been very unlikely in the early days of the epidemic. And it is a simple testament to some change that has occurred. So we must remember that it's not enough to just let women living with HIV sit in on a meeting or say a few words. Their voices will only be taken into account when we also ensure they're included as researchers, receive training and education, community work, lobbying and advocacy, and are always invited to give their perspectives at venues where their concerns are addressed. I'd also like to urge you, sorry, um, to incorporate the use of archival materials in your work on HIV and AIDS and other sexual and reproductive health issues. Much of what has been discovered, produced, and used in the past is still highly relevant to our work today. Donors usually want researchers and institutions to say they'll be working on new approaches, new materials, new issues, and being innovative is the key word. But materials produced earlier on in the epidemic still have much relevance, and those that proved effective can be easily updated and used in today's context. So let's not just review the past, but also learn and apply what we can from it. Thank you. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Alicia Diggs, who is uh, joining us as an HIV AIDS advocate, a motivational speaker, and an experienced public health educator. She holds a BA in social work from UNC Greensboro and also an MPH in public health education. And currently she's working on a PhD in public health education. So we got to support her to get to the finish line on that one. Um, and since 2013, she's uh, served as a board member of NCAN, which is the North Carolina AIDS Action Network. Um, and I'm sure she'll share some of her reflections on that uh, advocacy work with us. You want to learn more about Alicia? She has a really exciting Facebook page that she updates a lot, and there's a lot of links on it. And also through her work with NCAN, you can find out all about her on that website and other various U HIV AIDS activist websites. So please welcome me. Uh, please join me in welcoming Alicia Diggs. <laughs> Hi everyone. The mic is really loud, so I'm gonna try not to yell in it. Okay. <laughs> I'm really honored to be here. Um, when I get invites, it's very exciting because I have the opportunity to be what I call the voice for the voiceless. Um, I say that because hearing a lot of the information that Maria shared as I was sitting there, I was like, wow, she said a lot of things that I was gonna say. <laughs> but that just goes to show you that we're all in sync when it comes to this epidemic. And yes, it is still an epidemic. Um, years ago, I remember when I was between the ages of nine and 13, I was just hearing about HIV. And, you know, back then it was, oh, it's a disease for the gay white man. Oh, it's just the gay population. Oh, it's this population. So people were going around saying, well, hey, this doesn't affect me because I'm not a part of that population. But then later on, we find out that we're all affected by HIV and AIDS. I have been living 15 years with HIV. I never thought that this would be a part of my life, not in this arena, not like this. Um, when I got diagnosed, it was very, very unexpected for me. My brother taught me to always, always protect myself if I'm going to engage in sexual activity. So I understood. I knew about protection. My brother gave me the HIV 101 <laughs> sessions all the time. And I mentioned him because me and my big brother were very, very close. And he walked me through the streets of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, handing out pamphlets and condoms. 
I didn't say anything. I just held the bag and he shared all the information about HIV and AIDS. So that was an eye opening for me because I was subjected to a lot of different atmospheres that I wasn't used to. Growing up, I continued to take the information that my brother shared with me. Um, I lost my brother last year to um, complications with HIV and hepatitis. Um, hepatitis turned into liver disease. Me and my brother were very best friends. So I mentioned him quite a bit. I can't help it. He's a part of me and <laughs> I'm a part of him. Um, but once I received my diagnosis, I had a lot of options. I had an option to become a statistic of a woman who would have been locked up in prison for my actions. <laughs> and I mentioned that because I was engaged to my high school sweetheart and our wedding was two months before I got diagnosed. I had a cold. The cold was a normal cold like anybody else gets. It turned into strep, and me being a researcher that I am, I knew something else was wrong. And the doctors would say, no, Alicia, you're fine, you're fine. It's just a cold, it's strep, it'll go away. Well, to me, something else was not right because I knew my body. I always went for my checkups, I always protected myself. And before I was planning to get married, I made a vow to practice abstinence until I got married. So I knew that I was protecting myself. So how did this happen? Well, long story short, come to find out my now ex-husband knowingly infected me. And the response was, okay, yeah, I knew I was infected. So what, what are you going to do? As professional as I sound right now, <laughs> I wasn't that professional that day. But I had children also. My children were not from this relationship. Um, and I knew I had to protect my babies. I had to protect them. So even though I had an option to take action on the news that I received, I had to think about my children. I'm a mother. I'm all they have. And I would have lost my children had I took the steps that I wanted to take because I was angry and upset and hurt. Yes, I was angry, upset and hurt, but I had, I had a choice. What do you do now? So I prayed like, what is next? What do I do? And you know, I have a, a spiritual relationship with God, and he says, tell your story. I'm like, tell my story? Are you crazy? So people can laugh at me and look at me and call me names. And I heard a voice say, it's not about you. I was like, wow. That was profound to me because over the years, I've been speaking publicly since 2004, and I tell my story differently. Sometimes I don't even tell my story. I want to get the information out so that people know that HIV does not have a face at all. HIV does not have a color. It can happen to anyone. And people always ask, well, you know, how did you get through it? I got through it through support, through love that I didn't think that I was going to get. I was fearful of people judging me. Did I deal with stigma? Absolutely. I still deal with stigma. Stigma is just a part of something we all are going to have to deal with. And it's up to you to react in a way that's going to get you over the mountain and say, you know what? It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they do. As long as I know who I am. And as a woman living with HIV, I know who I am. So it doesn't bother me with different looks and different things that, you know, I hear. What I do is I educate people. I educate people on the terminology that's respectful for people who are living with HIV. And some of the information I was going to share, I'm not because Maria did. But I will let you guys know that women who are living with HIV, we experience a lot of barriers. A lot of barriers to care. A lot of barriers to support. There's a lot of embarrassment because there's still judgment when someone hears, okay, this person is HIV positive. Oh, well, what were they doing? Are they prostituting? Or are they this? Or are they that? Does it matter? They're still people. We are still people. And that's what we want people to understand, that we are people. We are people just like you. And it could have been the case that I went to the doctors and got a diagnosis of diabetes or cancer. Would you still stigmatize me because of that? Some people probably but then it's still up to me to educate those so that they can understand the path that we have to walk. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. I saw something in uh, one of the slides that Maria had up there, um, a person saying that they take 20 pills. They used to take 22. 
I could never imagine that. Science has advanced so tremendously. It's amazing. I take one pill a day, one pill. And I see things from the 80s and the 90s of, you know, people taking AZT and immediately dying. And people saying, oh, I have 30 pills to take. Can you imagine having to swallow a 30, 30 pills a day? And they're like the size of horse pills. And that's what we call them, horse pills. The one pill that I take, it is a big pill. But it's one pill I take, and I take it as my vitamin. It's my vitamin because it helps me to live. I am currently undetectable. The virus is not detected when I get my blood test done because I'm taking my regimen every day. I adhere to my regimen. I see my doctors all the time. As a matter of fact, I just change from every three months to every six months. They said, Alicia, you really don't have to come as often if you don't want to. I was like, okay, well, good, because I don't want to. (laughs) Because it's the same thing. And even though there are a lot of barriers out there, I can honestly say that I am one of not many women who don't deal with the barriers. The access to care that I have is great. My doctor is amazing. My doctor doesn't treat me as this patient with HIV or this patient with this number or this thing. My doctor takes time with me. My doctor remembers everything that I told her from the last visit that I had. When I go in, she said, well, the last time you were here, such and such was going on. And how's that going down? And and I'm sitting there with a smile like, yeah, she treats me like she really knows me. And I know she has lots and lots of patients, but the point is, she gives me my time. She doesn't rush me through. She'll even ask, is there anything else that you want to talk about? Anything else that you need? They're always right there for me. And that's excellent to hear something like that from a woman that's living with HIV, but I also know a lot of women who don't get that. A lot of women who say, I commend you for standing up there telling your business to everybody because I can't do it. I can't talk to my doctor. I haven't even told my family, and it's been 10 years. How do you do that? So I am that voice for the voiceless. I am the voice for the person who comes to me and say, Alicia, help. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I'm scared. I tried to go on a date, and the guy cursed me out because he said I was dirty. Or I didn't get the call back because they didn't want to be bothered. Now, these are some things that I've dealt with, trying to date. Do I desire it? Absolutely. I'm going on 45 years old. I want to date. (laughs) I want to date like the next person. Is it at the forefront of my head? No. No, because I have a bigger opportunity. My bigger opportunity is to be embraced by those who I'm being embraced by right now. When I try to date, I don't go out on my own. You know, I meet a lot of people and main questions will come up. What do you do? Oh, I'm an HIV activist. Oh, that's wonderful. How'd you get into that? Well, I'm living with HIV. And sometimes I hear, oh, wow, can you tell me more about that? And of course, I get excited and I'm telling, you know, my story and educating and all that. Then I hear the, oh, okay. And after everything is over, I'm going to call you and I'll let them know because I'm strong in who I am now. Oh, you don't have to. It's okay. And they're surprised by my strength. Well, my strength doesn't come from myself. My strengths come from everybody. My children, my family, my support system, the organizations that I'm a part of. And like mentioned, I'm with the North Carolina AIDS Action Network. As an advocate and going to things such as a Winter Walk for AIDS, which is coming up this Sunday in Greensboro, I would see, you know, the stand of NCAN. I'm like, I wonder where NCAN is. And then one day I'm at work and I get this call from the executive director for me to be a board member. And I'm excited. I cried. And people are just like, oh, that's so sweet. It was a big deal to me because it allows me a platform to be able to reach different people in the community. I'm not a person who um, follows a lot of policy. I'm not the policy person. I'm more of the advocate and the encourager and empower. So that's my portion. But working with NCAN, we have done so many different things together. The main thing that I really recall that we just recently did, we worked worked really hard to get an expansion for the Ryan White program so that people such as myself can continue to get HIV medication. 
and we succeeded. It was wonderful. It was really wonderful, even though I didn't know all of the policy verbiage, having a face right there for those, for the policy leaders to see, this is a person that looks like me that's living with HIV and that's vibrant. That's vibrant. I love telling some of my accolades, such as, like was mentioned, I'm working on my doctorate. Because I remember when I got diagnosed, I didn't think that I would see my children graduate. I didn't think that I would live to be an, a grandmother. I have three grandchildren. Both my children are grown. And now, within less than two years, I'll be getting my PhD. So I tell these stories to let people know HIV is not the end of the world. But HIV is not silent. It's going to take us as a people to take a stand and say, you know what, this, this matters. These people matter. They're my brother, they're my sister, and I have to be there for them. I have to speak up with them. No, it's not. I'm not a person living with HIV, but I'm affected by this. Because we would ask questions, how many people know someone with HIV? And most times you maybe get one or two hands in the air. But when I speak, I say, all of you know someone because you just met me. And you would not have known. You would have honestly thought that I was just an advocate for HIV. You can never tell who's living with HIV. Half this room could be living with HIV, and it doesn't even matter because we're all beautiful. We're all people with feelings. And that's something that I really, really try to um, stress upon. It's really our responsibility to be voices for those who can't speak for themselves, voices for those who are in other countries who don't have the access that we have. A lot of the women who don't have access, impoverished, no transportation. Oh, I'm not going to my doctor's appointment because I just can't make it. Oh, I have a co-payment and I don't have the money. There's a lot of times I've had co-payments, guys, and I was like, I don't want to go to the doctor's. I don't have the money. And I said, but you know what? My health is more important. I'll pay it when I can. And that's unfortunate that that happens for a lot of people. Some don't do what I do and say, you know what? I'm going to go anyway because I want to make sure that I'm okay. I have a lot of female friends that I know who are living with HIV, and they're really destitute. And you would think in 2016 it wouldn't be that way, but it is. It is. The, the phone calls, the inbox messages, I love them and I welcome them because I'm able to help someone who's not able to help themselves, even if it is with a kind word, even if it is me saying, you know what, I'll go to the doctors with you. Or somebody saying, I made a mistake and I know better. I need to get tested. Where do I go? Okay, well, I'll, I'll take off work and I'm going to go with you. Am I risking a lot? Yes. Does it matter to me? No. Because what if I was pushed to the side when I got diagnosed? I wouldn't be standing here today. I wouldn't be able to hold my head up high and say, I'm Alicia Diggs. I love who I am. Yes, I'm living with HIV but I'm an awesome person. I have very low self-esteem, very low self-esteem, um, afraid to walk in a room because I felt like people were looking at me saying, ooh, there's the dirty girl. Oh, there's the HIV girl. That's how I saw myself. Looking in the mirror, I saw HIV written all over my face as if people knew when they looked at me. I couldn't give direct eye contact because I assumed that, oh, you're looking at me because you know and you're going to go tell people. And then people are going to discriminate against me. So it took a lot to build my self-esteem. But not every woman has that. Not every woman is able to say I'm happy with myself. Not every woman is able to say I have a doctor's appointment tomorrow and I can go because I have gas money. Or I have transportation to get on the train or the bus or wherever they live. In a lot of the rural areas, people are not getting care. They're not getting care because they're... HIV agencies are miles and miles away. They have no transportation to get to them. They may not even have medical coverage, so that means they can't get medication, which means they can't live an undetectable lifestyle like myself. And I hear people say, well, undetectable, what do you mean by that? You mean that you could just go have sex and not pass it to anyone? That's what's being said, but why would you want to have unprotected sex anyway? Because it's not just HIV out here. Got herpes, gonorrhea, syphilis. There's so many 
risky illnesses out there. And we have the smarts. We have access to so much information. We have access to social media, to the internet that we didn't have back in the 80s. All we had was word of mouth. Now we have each other and it is our responsibility now that we know to take a stand and make sure that we don't let another person slip through the cracks, that we don't look down at a woman that's holding her head down, but hold her head up for her, encourage her and tell her, hey, you're beautiful. Don't be ashamed to walk up to a, a male or a female, say, you know what, you look really nice today. That means a lot. You never know what that person is going through. You have no idea how they're feeling that day. I've had people say, you know what, you said to me such and such and such and me and I was going to commit suicide. And I'm like, wow, and I'm blown away. And, you know, and I get emotional because I never thought that I made an impact on people's lives at all. I never thought that I was important, especially once I got diagnosed. I knew I wasn't important. I knew I couldn't do anything else. I knew it wasn't a death sentence. But I felt like, whose life can I impact? How can I educate someone on protecting themselves when I didn't do it either? And people say, well, you got married. I got married after my diagnosis. And they say, well, you still marry him? Yeah, I married him, number one. I didn't think anybody was going to want to be with me. Who wants to be with the girl with a disease you can't get rid of? And I said, well, he loves me. He wants to be with me. I'll just marry this man and we'll die together and take care of ourselves. And immediately after the wedding is when this news hits me like, oh, yeah, I knew. That's a hard pill to swallow. To love someone and entrust someone with your life. It is a hard pill to swallow. It wasn't like I was just out walking the streets and I met some stranger. This was someone that I knew since I was 14 years old and I married him when I was 30. So someone I thought I knew. So I tell people, it doesn't matter if you know someone, if you think you know someone. If you love yourself, protect yourself enough to protect that other person. It's very, very important to do that. And before I close, I am going to um, just share that for those of you who are not, feel like you're not affected by HIV and you hear things like, full-blown AIDS. There's no such thing. We want to change the language to be respectful. I didn't realize language until I worked with disabled adult students. And one of them told me, we don't like the word retarded because it makes us feel bad. And I was just like, wow. And I said, wow, because we use retarded like, like it's nothing, just candy. Like, oh, man, I it's retarded what you did. Well, when they hear that, it hurts their feelings. Well, taking it to a person living with HIV, when you say that person that has AIDS or that person that's infected, infected is a terrible, terrible word for people living with HIV. Because when you think of a sore that has got infected, it's gross. So you're saying that we're gross. And people don't think of it that way, but that's how we feel. Because originally when we get the diagnosis, we already feel bad. So some of the language that's going on, we try to educate people. So it's better to say a person living with HIV. I used to say, hey, I'm infected with HIV. And as I learned language and better things to say, it started making me feel better. And it started, it allowed me to respect other people. So I just share that with you to remember when you're not, not just talking to a person that's living with HIV, with anybody. Watch your language. Try to watch the things that you say. But also be loving towards people. I didn't come up today to give you numbers because you could Google that yourself. You can get all the basic information that we're able to share as advocates and educators. But I wanted to come to you um, personally as a person and share some of my triumphs and some of the um, transgressions that I've dealt with as a person living with HIV. Like I said, I'm not one who has had difficulty when it came to the health care system, but I've dealt with the stigma. I've dealt with 
um, trying to date and hearing, ooh, I can't mess with you. That's really, really hurtful. I had someone say that, ooh, you mean to tell me you were going to come around me and you didn't tell me you had that thing? And I'm like, wow, really? Did you just say that to me? So things like that are still going on in 2016. Those things are still going on. And there are many people that I know who have committed suicide once they got diagnosed. I don't want to live with this. I can't live with this. I can't tell my parents. I can't tell my kids. And they decide I'm going to kill myself. When we are here to support and to love them, that's so very important. While it's important to get the numbers, while it's important to get the definitions, it's important to be sensitive to other people. And that's really all that I have to share with you and what I desire to share with you. And I thank you all for even taking the time to sit here because you could be anywhere else on a Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> you could be somewhere else. And I really, really appreciate you guys. I want you to know how much it means that you all are here. The numbers are not important. It's the quant, the quant, the quality. Excuse me. It is the quality, and I feel like the information that has been shared thus far has been helpful to you all. And if you have any questions for me, I'm extremely transparent. I'm like Marie. I should have read because um I could keep you here all day. <laughs> I have a lot of information inside of me, but. I felt like when I came up here, it's most important for me to share who I am and who people are who are living with HIV. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to introduce Kelly Swain, who's a poet, a writer, and an educator. So education is a theme from all of our three speakers today. And currently, she's a poet in residence at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. And she was previously, before that position, a poet in residence at the Whipple Museum of History of Science at the University of Cambridge. Um, she's a writer, and her literary works include a novel called The Naked Muse, which is about her life as an artist's model, and a previous book called Double the Stars, which is about the 18th uh, century female astronomer, Carolyn Herschel. She's also a poet, has published three books of poetry and some uh, poetry anthologies as well, been an editor of those. And our collaboration, she uh, contributes regularly to the blue section of The Lancet, and we just had a piece come out together, which is really exciting for me. For the past two weeks, she's been here with us as an artist in residence in the Health Humanities Lab, leading the workshop that will uh, see some of the results of that. Uh, after uh, Kelly presents, three of the students will talk about their work with Kelly. And also on uh, November 17th, a few weeks ago, she engaged in a wonderful workshop um, with Jennifer uh, Ahern Dodson in the How I Write series here. And that you can listen to if you missed it. It'll soon be streaming on the Duke Faculty Write program website. And finally, we all have websites, and Kelly has a beautiful website, uh, WordPress website, so you can learn a lot more about her work and links to her work there. So I will ask Kelly to come up and speak. Let's see. Is this all right to leave it like that? Or do you want not, what, Was it running before? What do you mean? Do I just? Yeah. So will that, though? Yeah. OK, thank you. <laughs> You can see that I'm, I'm I like paper. <laughs> um, wow, hello. Uh, I'm really honored and um, a bit stunned to go after such a strong speech. So thank you. It's really amazing to meet you, Alicia, and to hear from Maria. And in a way, I'm kind of relieved that we did this workshop in this order of events because. I love how things can come out of collaborations. Sometimes when you don't overly think them or plan them, although that's not to say we haven't done a lot of thinking and planning. Uh, as Carrie pointed out, we've been talking about me coming here to visit for three years. So I want to start off with some thank yous. Um, first to Carrie for all the work she's been doing 
the amount of behind the scenes work that has gone into this and to the artwork you'll see later uh, is really impressive. And uh, to Deborah, to Rachel, to Meg, to Thomas, who has gone well beyond the call of duty, rescuing me when my car was stolen, among other things, um, and to the students who have been really a joy to work with. I only wish we had more time, but I feel really grateful that we had quite a lot of time. And I find it really amazing that uh, the theme I wanted to talk about, I start off with four words, excavating, recontextualizing, translation, and transformation. Um, a theme throughout all of my writing and all of my career as a writer is always transformation. And I start off with a quote from The Metamorphosis. My soul is wrought to sing of forms transformed to bodies new and strange. Uh, I use this quote in one of my poetry books, which is about anatomical models. But it's really lovely to speak after Alicia um, because even though I can't speak as eloquently as she can, she is this embodiment of choosing to transform herself in a really amazing and beautiful way. And I, I think that's just the most sort of strong and uh, powerful thing to, to represent, as you say, the voices that we don't always hear. And um, sort of serendipitously, the, the artwork that I tried to bring in and uh, show to the students and teach to the students is also about transformation. So I'll tell you a little bit about the background. So we've got scrolling here on the screen the artwork that's on display, which I hope you'll be able to look at in person. It's just around the corner in the Perkins Library. And the style is from the book that's on the table there, which I hope you'll also look at when we have the reception. It's called A Humament by Tom Phillips. Um, and in 1966, the English artist Tom Phillips took uh, a Victorian novel from a junk shop that he bought for three pence, and he made a bet with a friend that he could transform every single page of the Victorian novel. It's called a humament because the original title of the novel is called A Human Document, which again, purely serendipitously, really translates into our global health humanities work because especially with Maria's archives, we're looking at human documents, documents of human stories. I think, to be honest, for a Victorian novel title, it's rather dry and clunky, but then again, that's Victorian. And Tom Phillips painted and edited and reworked and collaged every page of this book. Uh, it was first displayed in 1973 at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, and it went on to travel to many, many art exhibitions, and Phillips recreated this book and decided that his full artistic project would be not only to revise every page of this novel, but to create enough editions of the novel so that eventually it created a cycle where every piece of art he made from the original page would then itself be transformed. This created six editions, and the project uh, took him 50 years of his creative life. And what's really exciting, along with all of this other coincidence, is that that book is the sixth edition. It's the final edition. It was published this year. And Carrie emailed me frantically before I left London and said, get a copy. <laughs> and I managed to do that. So um, it's really lovely. I think Tom Phillips would be surprised at what we're doing because he didn't plan that this was a global health or medical endeavor. This was an art project for him. But I hope and think that he would be pleased and surprised. James Kidd called Phillips's work, a collaboration and a collision between language and the visual and between Malik, the original author, and Phillips, the artist. So I want us to consider these pieces of student artwork, their collaborations, and some of them are collisions. Some of them create sparks. And I want us to think about how and what sort of transformations occur as we look at these pages. Um, as you can see here, each piece often covers up most of the original text, 
And when the pieces are uh, taken down from their two month display, they will uh, be made into a student archive, which will go into the uh, Rubenstein Library collections, and that's thanks to Rachel, so that's really exciting. Each student will have um, a reference of the original piece that's in Maria's archive, so that as people come back to this, they can look at the original and look at the artwork and think about those things together. And again, if we think about transformation, I think that's a really exciting outcome that has uh, grown from this as really as we've been here. That wasn't originally planned, but I'm really pleased that that's happening. So even though to use the word traditional is not really appropriate for Tom Phillips's book because he invented this format, um, the background, the brief background is that Phillips took this idea from the work of Brian Geisen and William S. Burroughs. They created this technique called cut-ups, where you literally cut up a piece of paper and rearrange it to create new words and new sentences. So this is concrete poetry. And that's where, as a poet, I came to this book. I um, learned about it in its fifth edition, so the one right before this edition. And I just love the technique. I think it's a very beautiful thing. I think it's a very colorful thing. And it's also something that's really useful to work with when you're not necessarily with students who are in advanced creative writing or you don't know what their creative writing background is because there's this idea that to confront a student with the blank page is a, a great and terrible thing. and. Uh, I decided that uh, back when I worked at Imperial College London, I decided that instead of facing students with a blank page, I would face them with a dense block of text. And um, I don't know if this was preferable, but <laughs> it seems to work out because students are invited to choose words and phrases, as you can see here, and create an image around it. Um, so that's where this idea of excavation comes from, that they're excavating a story from the text that might be unexpected, um, that isn't there to begin with or wasn't in intentionally there. And so like sculptors, students are expected to carve away, um, or maybe like anthropologists, they are excavating but not really sure of what they're going to discover. And all of these ways of working with the text are very transformative. Um, this one especially follows Phillips's kind of style of, if you follow the line, it creates the narrative uh, through the words. And like I said, you'll, you'll get the chance to see these in a static way, uh, but they're very dynamic on the wall altogether. So when I took this technique to Humanities and Global Health at Imperial College London, which I was invited to create um, this course and to teach it to medical students, uh, the first thing I invited them to humanize was the Hippocratic Oath, uh, which is a, a great place to start. Every medical school has their own version of the Hippocratic Oath, which as far as I can tell aren't terribly different. but generally the same thing. And I will never forget that one student managed to do this technique to the Hippocratic Oath so that it said, when I am a new doctor, I will do admin. <laughs> uh, and it was sort of shocking and I hope cathartic for him and funny, but maybe kind of sad. So I think it's a great example of how students are allowed a great deal of creative freedom. I hope catharsis. Um, this example is a song. Uh, so I was so impressed. I am so impressed. I'm, I'm proud. I'm pleased. I'm really honored to be part of this. Um, and I hope that as well as this idea of transformation, what this workshop has allowed is some different kind and use of space. Uh, Phillips was also interested in the use of space. He, he experimented over 50 years with this idea of what he called rivers through the text, um, shapes coming out of the text. Uh, along with Geisen and Burroughs, another main influence for Phillips was the composer John Cage. And I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but um, in the very first lecture the students had with me two weeks ago, I. Uh, expose them to John Cage's famous work, Four Minutes and 33 Seconds, which is a four minute and 33 second performance of silence, which can be played on any instrument. 
<laughs> and so without telling them or warning them what was happening, I just said, you know, trust me, let's go along with this. Put away your laptops, put away your phones. And I made them sit there for four minutes and 33 seconds while they watched a YouTube video of a man in a coat and tails not play a piano. And we talked about it and some students were frustrated and one had seen it. So she knew what was coming. But what I want students to think about with this activity and by showing them that piece is this idea of space. Space and silence, the importance of what we leave in and the importance of what we take out. And that in a world as busy as this, not just in the US, but definitely as I've seen here at Duke, maybe silence is something of an endangered species and that we should give it a little bit more attention. So I'm very glad, torturous as it may have been, to make the students have that opportunity. So this is a collaboration between AIDS, art, and archives. And as Philip says about the connections that his artwork has revealed in Malik's texts, Philip says they're in the Malik text waiting to be discovered, but not in an active sense, in a passive or innocent sense innocent of what is done to them, what is done to them might enrich them. And I think that's a really interesting statement because I hope this enriches, or as I say, transforms this use of the archive. Um, I know it's an untraditional way to use an archive, and I was a little bit nervous about what Maria might think of it. She's been wonderful about it. Um, and also that idea of the passive or the innocent, that. I did talk with the students about how this is sensitive material. This is material that is about people's stories. And we have to interpret and not appropriate these stories. And I feel very confident that the students have been respectful and emotive. And they've made really beautiful creations out of stories that are often of suffering and of the lack of an opportunity for voices being able to be heard. So voices have been drawn out of the text in a way that I hope uh, is along the lines of the themes that we've talked about today. So back to that original, I really hope that you're seeing forms transformed. And I've kind of pointed out some of the work as it's scrolling through. Um, but I, I just jotted down some of these words, which you might not be able to read from there, um, but I hope you'll see on the wall. Uh, you're going to hear from three of the students in a minute. Some of the words that came out, and I didn't mean to omit anybody's. I wish I could read them all, but um, this piece that's just uh, here, we have a, a, in the middle, a child had died. She was so young, but I grew up. Um, and I, I love just the different styles that we have, the different ways of being powerful, I think, that really come through. The different three-dimensional artworks that some students have used, which has been really fun to see. Uh, we've got some burning and beadwork going on, a lot of glitter. I love the three-dimensional element that has come up with some of these. We've got the abstract, and um, we gave students pastels to work with in case they didn't have artworks. I like the repetition here with the assistance of that's repeated seven times. Um, this is the song that I mentioned. Out of the darkness, let's stand. We'll save the world. Hear them sing and understand. Today, we've got to shed a light on AIDS. We'll lead together. We'll fight. Um, and to sing of forms transformed, I think it's a good, good place to end with a song. So thank you very much for your time and thank you for having me. Um, hi, uh, my name is Adam Tillahoon. I'm a sophomore here at Duke, um, studying visual media studies and global health. When I saw the words like narrative of, narrative of HIV um, patients or people living with HIV, I did not know exactly what to think of. But um, usually when we study HIV, Narratives are not exactly what we think of. It's usually more medical and um, the details of it and not necessarily the stories of the people um, that
that we interact with and that kind of becomes background. And I thought it was really interesting, maybe perhaps learning more about it. And um, not only have I learned how narratives can not only preserve and change how we perceive people, but most, most importantly, how they even change the people's lives who live with HIV. And I feel like that's been the biggest lesson throughout um, the class. Um, so the one thing that I absolutely love about the class is when we think about narratives, it's very multidimensional where we think about like the traditional narrative, poetic narrative, and then visual narratives. And then with the Human Project and um, what Kelly has helped us bring together throughout the last um, couple of weeks, kind of the combination of all these three has been a beautiful um, result as you, as you see. And I, I think has brought out things that we usually don't think about when we think of narratives. Um, so when we first started going through the archives, um, there was one box, box six, I remember, went through it, and then there was the one folder that I opened titled East African Regional Workshops. And to be honest with you, the reason I opened it was I'm originally from Ethiopia, and I thought maybe I'll find something related to that in the folder. Um, to my surprise, I when I flipped through it, um, went about halfway, didn't find anything. And the first um, paper that kind of caught my eye was this one page embellished with these phrases that I thought were satirical, maybe even a joke. And um, I don't know if you can read the phrases, but a lot of them went like this. So um, the phrases that I highlighted are, women are less intelligent than men um, with very small intellect. The souls of women are very small. Real men are macho. The more women you take to bed, it makes you real man. And the last one was, men need sex. So these were the phrases that stood out to me on this particular page. So I put that page aside, went through the box, went through a whole bunch of other boxes. But when I first saw this page, this is the image that came to my mind because I actually thought this was, I, did, I didn't know exactly what to interpret it as, but um, Kelly had said not to look too much into it and kind of focus on what kind of feelings it conveys to you. And um, that's kind of what happened with this particular page. And even after going through multiple boxes, this is the page I came back to. So just in terms of like the details of um, what I decided to do with it, um, so it's not it's not anything new that misogyny and sexism play a huge role, and um, who are the people who are um, who suffer the most when it comes to living with HIV, and um, the first thing I learned about that in my Global Health 101 class last year was how Black women are usually um, at the forefront of the many negative outcomes that come with living with HIV. So when I decided to have a person be part of the piece, um, I decided to use a silhouette, and specifically a black silhouette for two reasons. So one is even though black women are one of the biggest victims, I feel like they're the people who are in the shadows and are not talked about. Um, as Alicia said, it's, it's the disease of the, black, the white gay man, and it's been perceived so for such a long time. And I really want to bring light to the fact that <laughs> these women are in the shadows but are always suffering, especially thinking about women who are um, in impoverished places. Um, and secondly, uh, the, the fact that it is black speaks to the fact that I'm talking about black women, but more importantly, the only signifier that you can say, that you can see is a black woman is the hair, which brings a lot of symbolism. The fact that black women's hair is, um, it's not just hair, it has a lot of political implications to it not just in terms of um, part of someone's body, but identity as well, and culture. So um, that's my reason for using the silhouette and making it black. I decided to use the color red because, of course, um, it's the color that's closely associated with AIDS. But at the same time, I see the color red to be um, not only of, of um, strength and boldness, but at the same time, it may elicit um, fear and pain, especially with the association of the chains that go within the piece. Um, so the, I wanted to create that tension because I want this piece to be something, like Kelly said, yes, we're, I'm looking at a page that has information, quotes that men have said about women, but at the same time, I want to shine light on the fact that women are so stronger than these statements that are said about them. Um, and that's kind of when the chains come in, and the chains are what literally and metaphorically kind of tie everything together, and where you see some of them are... Um, draped and hanging, but then some of them are breaking. And I want this to reflect the fact that, yes, we've come um, really far when it comes to 
kind of fighting misogyny and sexism and gender-based violence, but there's a long way to go, which is why like some people, I've asked a lot of my family members and friends to see, when they see this picture, it seems like she's struggling and breaking it or she's just struggling and not breaking it. So it's this tension of middle ground that is created with a contrast of the colors and the position that the subject is in as well as the chains. And um, I, wanted to, I wanted to convey that, yes, we've come far, but we have a long way to go in terms of making progress um, and uh, encouraging and supporting black women who live with HIV specifically. And um, yeah, thank you so much for that. I just want to start off again by thanking Dr. Stewart. This is, I think, for most of us in the class, probably been the most thought-provoking class we've ever taken. And I think this human mit part of it has, at least for me, it's been my favorite part of the class so far. Um, thinking back um, to what uh, we heard earlier about this project being a mixture of uh, collaboration and collision, I, I think that mine is definitely more collision. Um, let's see. Um, the page I chose uh, from this archives deals with how commonly held societal opinions on people with certain identity markers can actually restrict um, HIV AIDS progress. So in thinking about progress, I really struggled with what to put in the background for the art of my piece um, until I actually looked at my laptop and saw a sticker on my laptop that had my Hillary I'm with her sticker on it. And um, then I saw the arrow on that uh, logo with the H and the arrow, and I was like, oh. Um, so I began to equate that arrow with progress in my mind. Um, so it's actually kind of weird that I put that arrow on this page, considering that literally nothing on this page is progressive. It's literally a collection of really problematic statements, such as, uh, no matter who and how a woman is, her intellect is very small. A woman has no right to refuse sex. I would rather sire a cow than a homosexual. With a cow you get milk, but what possible good or value would come out of a homosexual? These statements to me encompass the exact opposite of what Hillary's arrow of progress means. Um, so I began to toy with the idea of arrows facing the opposite directions and maybe, maybe even pushing against each other. And then I sort of accidentally discovered that you can tessellate arrows. Uh, so I did. Um, and so once I got uh, that figured out, I was like, okay, sweet. Or wait, um, so the arrows facing one direction are supposed to represent progress, while the arrows facing the opposite direction are supposed to represent resistance to that progress. Um, so once I got that, I decided I was trying to figure out what colors to do the arrows. And at first, my obvious answer to that question was to do them in very opposite contrasting colors because uh, progress and resistance are you know, opposites. Um, but then when I really got thinking about it, I was about to put the marker on the page, and then I was like, that's not right. That's, that's not right. Um, most of us in this room agree on what progress is, but obviously a lot of people out there have a very different definition of what progress is and what direction is the right direction to go. Um, so that sort of blurs what the word progress actually means. So hopefully the lines between these arrows are a little blurred to reflect that since I chose colors that are so similar. Um, and additionally, I would like to think that, um, maybe I'm just being naive and optimistic, but I would like to think um, that even the people who resist our definition of progress do so because that's what they think is best. Um, that they just have a different different view of what best is. And while that may seem messed up to most of us in this room still, it's better than thinking that their definition of progress is different just because they like to watch us suffer. And um, I'd like to think that progress and resistance stem from the same desire to create a better world. Um, so then when I was thinking about that, I realized that progress and resistance, their arrows are not different. They're not different colors. They're the same color arrow, the same type of arrow facing in different directions. Um, so that's why I decided to make the arrows such similar colors. Um, but let's be real, um, even the people, even if these people said these things with good intentions, they're wrong. Um, 
women are smart. <laughs> women do have the right to refuse sex. And gay men can do good things, even if producing cow milk is not one of those. Um, so I felt an urge, a really strong urge, to correct these statements. Um, so I did. And just like our high school English teachers, I took out my red pen and went to town. Um, and it actually felt so good. And when we were having our workshop, um, we talked about several different ways that I could maybe cross out these problematic statements and replace them. And I tried them all in my rough drafts. And then at the end of the day, I was like, no, it just feels really good to physically draw a line through these messed up things. And that's what I'm going to do. And so I replaced them. So I don't know if you can read it, but it's um, instead of it saying, no matter who and how women is, her intellect is very small, it now reads, no matter who and how women is, her intellect is limitless. Instead of it reading, what possible good or value would come out of a homosexual, it now reads, every good or value would come out of a homosexual. I also really like this metaphor of a teacher grading these statements. Um, first off, because I know that these people would have failed my class. Um, and second off, because I like the idea of them learning and that maybe if they could understand where we're coming from, half those arrows in the background could rotate and face the same direction that I'm thinking to face our direction of our definition of what progress really is. Hopefully, that's equality. Um, and then, like I said at the top of the page, what I linked out there, uh, opinions have an impact on health. Uh, and I think it's interesting, because as much as I want those arrows to change, I think that opinions actually are the hardest things to change. So I was going to talk a little bit about my thought process in making the human piece. And so to do that, I started with reflecting on the films we'd watched in this semester in class and the readings we had read. And one theme that really jumped out at me was how encompassing AIDS is in a personal narrative. That in most of the films we've seen, I know little about the people's life other than their AIDS experiences. And so after learning about the human project was an opportunity to uncover hidden storylines in a text, I wanted to choose a personal narrative and which would help me uncover the story of an individual that had been previously hidden by AIDS. So while looking through the archives, I found a book called Diamonds, Stories of Women from the Asia Pacific Network of People Living with HIV. After flipping through it, this one narrative stuck out to me in particular because the of the there's a complicated relationship between the risk factors for uh, living with AIDS and they seem to really jump out of the page at me. And this gave me the idea to do something three-dimensional, that I wanted to be able to cover up the AIDS aspects of the narrative with something three-dimensional to show that it does jump out of the page, but there's also a negative space behind it, which is someone's life experience. The second theme I noticed in the films we watched and the readings we read was this idea of vulnerability, that also there's personal vulnerability of having the illness, with physical manifestation of complications, but also the emotional vulnerability of difficulty coping, loss of relationships, and stigma. I also saw a lot about the vulnerability in becoming a patient, both physically, that you're seeing a lot of doctors who are touching you and trying to treat you, but also emotionally, that you meet a doctor who's a complete stranger and they'll know the most intimate details about your life before they may even know your first name. So to highlight this vulnerability, I wanted to make the 3D aspect of my project, the illness part, something that people would be able to touch and feel compelled to touch. And so the use of fabric came to mind first, but after thinking about the association between blankets and illness, I decided to crochet panels like a blanket. I decided to use the clashing shades of red yarn because AIDS is typically represented with red, but the clashing shades would show that even if you're expecting complications to happen, they're always still a surprise. To follow through on the negative space theme, I decided to use different stitches that would allow more and less negative space to come through, um, thus showing the difference between the life not affected by AIDS and the life affected by AIDS. There's no correlation between the colors used in the stitch to reveal how the acuity of a complication is not directly related to how much it covers up an individual's life, as there are other factors such as the support network and other living situations that contribute to how much a complication will affect someone at a given time in their life. 
I left some of the ends loose on the yarn rather than sewing them into the panels because I wanted to show how a complication with the illness is even when it's over, it doesn't go away, that it's kind of a lingering effect. At this point, I thought I had finished the project when I had added just enough panels to cover what I need to cover, and so I let it sit for a couple days. But after thinking about it, I realized that some of the words on the side had an open space and that they weren't completely surrounded. And from seeing the experiences of um, narratives of living with AIDS, that it's something that it was always with you. And so I wanted to create the yarn so that it would encircle the whole narrative. Um, finally, to, the to tie the themes of vulnerability and illness taking over one's life together, I added the panel at the bottom which um, is a picture of a sign promoting hand washing that might be found at a hospital. And I, was, I used this to hope to invite people to touch the art, but also to reveal how objectifying illness can be. The Human Project allowed us to engage with the archive materials in a different way than we had ever before, and it allowed me to expand my view of what can be learned from illness narratives. The process of extracting the different strands of meaning out of the text was very valuable, as I learned to challenge my initial assumptions of what to see beyond in a text. Furthermore, the process of creating the art challenged me to think more deeply about what living with AIDS is truly like. With every successive artistic decision to make, such as what stitch to use or what color yarn, I felt as though I brought, was brought closer to feeling the experience of living with AIDS rather than merely thinking about it on an intellectual level. By the end of the project, after all the spaces were encircled by yarn, I too began to feel a little suffocated by the illness. This ultimately showed me the value of this experience as I realized the whole process had made me more empathetic to the struggles and the tribulations of what it's like to live with HIV and AIDS. So I'm sort of speechless myself. Um, if I die tomorrow, I just, this would have been the, the best class that I've ever taught and have enjoyed it so much. And I just want to thank all the students, our TA, Taylor Haynes, as well. Um, it's been a remarkable journey, started with Kelly. And um, uh, thank you, students. I thought this was fascinating. And see, listening to the three students explain how they made their pieces, what thinking was that went into it, what they learned about it while they were doing it, made me, I mean, I, in addition to being a medical anthropologist, I also had part of my career as an editor and writer. And so immediately I'm thinking, wouldn't it be cool to make a booklet out of this with the piece and for every student to write a piece on how they did that. What these three students did, for, but have everybody do that with their pieces. I think that would be fascinating and I'd love to share it with many of my colleagues in developing <coughs> countries. I think they'd find it really interesting too. It was absolutely emotional <laughs> in a good way um, because I saw how each piece was taken personally. Um, I saw myself and a lot of the people that I know inside of each piece and explanation. Um, but while sitting there, I'm, I mean, I am a baby. I'm a baby of the baby as I cry about everything. Um, I was just like, wow, my cheeks are hurting just from smiling because you guys put so much of your heart into it. And it's just amazing. I, I think it's, um, it's very creative. I, I have no creative creativity whatsoever and and even looking down at the picture that's up I didn't realize the different shades of red until she said something and it's just amazing I just I really really commend you guys I'm sure that um, coming into the class it was just like wow okay how am I going to do this because that's how I would be like this is just it's amazing I'm really speechless um, I really commend you guys and thank you so much <laughs> well, I'll uh, close. There was one thank you that I forgot, which is Meg Brown. <clears throat> oh, go ahead, Christina. Do you... mm -hmm. Yeah, Christina has an announcement. Come on up. Christina is also a member of the class. And 
in the face of our little promotional video. Thank you for that. Hi, everybody. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to all of our speakers and presenters for really um, sharing a lot of the experiences that we have gone through as a class um, in doing not only the human mint exercise, but a coursework of um, uh, engagement in HIV narratives. Um, for our final projects for this class, um, a lot of our students are doing documentaries and different kinds of ways to engage in a final way with um, narratives um, of living with HIV. And my group, which includes Sarah, who um, presented her piece last, her human mint piece, um, we are doing a project called AIDS 35, which will take place tomorrow um, in Link Classroom 1 at 8 p.m. Uh, we are curating a series of performances of spoken word poetry written by HIV positive and affected individuals um, from a diversity of backgrounds and countries. And we would love to see you there to continue a lot of the discussions that we have been having today. Um, the spoken word poems will be performed by um, spoken word artists here at Duke, um, including class members here. And we would love to see you there. Um, so, 8 p.m. in Classroom 1 in the link, which is in this building. Um, thanks. Thanks, Christina. <laughs> okay, so tomorrow night, 8 p.m. in the link, um, their spoken word um, event will be great, 8 p.m. So I just, I neglected to thank Meg Brown, who is really the force behind the Perkins Gallery wall, so it's a nice sort of segue here. We have a lovely reception. But Meg Brown is the uh, curator of the ex exhibition spaces here in Perkins. And she and I have been going back and forth for over a year, first to reserve the space and then for, to have her sort of guide us through this process of how to transform the student's work into a wall, an exhibit wall. Um, and there were a lot of steps in there. I'm really grateful for that. So please come and join your, uh, take some of the reception food. Can, we, can I say that? Can you circulate? OK. <laughs> Get some reception food, go either uh, to the Perkins Gallery Wall to see the student work. You can't go into the Josiah uh, Trent um, room with the food, but do if you, if you can. They have a lovely display case of Maria's uh, materials from Maria's archive. And I just want to thank everyone for joining us. This has been a great event. Thank you. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.